mindset. And the old saying of uh, to the victor goes the spoils also includes editorial rights on what is put down on paper as history, what is taught in schools as history, uh, what is reflected for decades, possibly after the event. But that doesn't mean it's factual. It means that those who were victors had the opportunity unhindered to write an historical account of an event. Now, there is no victors in this society. Our society has come out of a bloody conflict. It's very, very fresh in many people's minds. It has continues to be a challenge to resolve all the outworkings of that conflict, the different versions of that conflict, and whose version of history is the correct version. And there's a danger in our society that the struggle over that will actually impede our progress. Because we're all the different sides of the conflict are trying to, for want of a better word, impose their version of history to ensure that that's the version that was into the future. And I, I'm an Irish Republican. I, I'm a minister appointed to serve all the people of, of, of our society, regardless of their political or religious beliefs. And that presents challenges for people who come from a different side of the argument. At times it presents challenges for me because my history is different from some other people's history. And I have to manage that very carefully. I have to be conscious at all times that I have to work to the best interests of everyone. And education in any society is a very, very sensitive subject. Not just the history or the politics of that society, but every, well, the vast majority of parents want the very, very best for their children. They want to ensure that their children have uh, every opportunity in life that they progress through education and they become valued members of society. And so all sorts of things go around that. Religious belief and education are often argued to be too close or too far apart. Uh, <coughs> history. Which version of history do you produce in your schools? Um, and not on a number of other areas. Now, I think by accident or by design in this society, we have ado adopted a very, and this is before my time, a, a, a very neutral but inclusive curriculum. Because my job as a minister is not to dictate what subject books, what material, what is taught in the classroom. My job as a minister is to set the curriculum and then allow our teachers, the professionals, to use whichever materials they believe are to the ethos, to the benefit or to the understanding of the school, its pupils, etc. So therefore, even I as an Irish Republican cannot, and more importantly, should not dictate my version of history in the classroom. It goes back to my original point then. Can you teach history? Or should you encourage your students to study and research history? And I've, the professionalism of our teaching workforce here allows them to do that. So, but as importantly as that, part of that teaching, that learning process, must be, must be in a way that challenges the pupil and the individual. Because, as I say, to learn anything about the past, you have to research. No one can sit or stand and say, well, this is actually what happened. See this version of history here? That's the correct version of history. See that bit over there? That's not so good. Because when you, beyond these shores when you look at history, uh, and I'm not an expert in how many of, of the countries here takes history, but history has changed down through the years when the opening up of society has developed in many countries, when countries have been liberated from uh, previous masters, when the recognition that women actually did exist in history, the recognition that there was gay people in history, that ethnic minorities existed in history, that the political uh, political chains by some dictatorships, when they were thrown off, people actually learned more about themselves in their history than there was in the past. So we need to therefore accept, and I'm not arguing anybody in the room is different or agrees with me either, 
that uh, history often is penned by those who were victorious in, in whatever way that might be. Now, I'm delighted to see you all here. I'm delighted that you're clear has decided to hold your conference here because this is quite a significant uh, year in the history of, of the island of Ireland. Very significant, in fact. And I, 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 the song, I, I, I never under, really understood the reaction, the hold the song had on many members of the unionist community. But, but I'll, I'll tell you a little story as to how I opened my eyes uh, by a conversation which actually was not with me but directed at me. I was a, a councillor in Craig Allen Council, which may be familiar with some in the room and then maybe not to others, but during the height of the conflict, Craig Allen Council was a bit of a burden. Uh, and we set up an equality committee. And it was the idea of the then chief executive to try and get the parties to work closer together and understand each other better. And in the midst of one of several rows during this meeting, uh, a unionist councillor was talking about the song. And he says, you don't understand us, you don't understand us. And he was right. He was absolutely right. And he reflected on the small, I'm not named the village because he may not want to admit that he spoke towards me even at that time. Uh, he reflected on his home village, which probably at this stage is maybe three, four hundred families living in. And he says, do you know in the weeks following the song, every other house in my village received a, a telegram telling them that one of their members of their family had been killed at the song. He says, what impact do you think that has? And at that very moment, I understood. I understood the impact the song had on the psychology, uh, the mentality of the unionist community. Not, not just simply immediately after such a horrific event, but in the decades that followed it. And even that accidental conversation opened my eyes to what impact the Battle of the Soul had on the community. A community I, I am trying to work with. And I, I, well, that may be unfair to myself because unionism with a small U are, are everyday people. Well, and sometimes we get this mistake and we use political labels for people. Well, I, I have no disagreement with unionism with a small U. I'm a politician and I reserve the right to have a disagreement with unionist politicians and I will refer to as a capital U. So I think in that sense that, that councillor then gave me an opportunity to research history and understand history. Now, and I think that deserve, the, the song deserves equal recognition even from me as an Irish Republican as, as, an, as I will as an Irish Republican give to the 1916 race. And there is another event now, if you look at people talk about the men of 1916. Now, the signatories of the proclamation are all men. But those involved in the 1916 rising were not all men. Uh, it had, both events had such an impact on Ireland, on the people, on unionism, on nationalists, as Republicans, and that impacts today. But that's not unique in any country or society. I'm sure those from outside the East Shore City. There's been a series of events in your nation's history which still has a significant impact on the thinking of your peoples today. And I've no doubt either that there will be different uh, events in your history which one of your peoples will have a loyalty to when others mightn't. There will be different events in your country's history which to this day cause division. Because one of the things that I think we, we need to shake off in this society is, is to stop being so insular and stop believing that we are the only society that is divided, that we are the only society that has yet to come to peace with itself, that we are the only people uh, in Europe or beyond who do, who've had a violent history, who've had uh, events in the past which we can hang our heads in shame over. And I think that's one of the places our society has to go to. Our society has to understand that in being part of Europe, being part of the world, we're not unique. And in many ways, we have to accept that 
before we move on to the next stage of the peace process. And while our peace process has been difficult, it has been frustrating, it has been at times at risk of collapsing, you have to understand why there is a peace process. There was a conflict here. People from either side or multitudes of sides got so frustrated, so uh, lost belief in the democratic process that a conflict broke out. Now, do you see where you've had a conflict? The signing of a peace agreement is only part of the process. You have to deliver more and more and more change to ensure that confidence in the piece of paper you have signed remains, confidence that there is another way, and I don't know how long the peace process will go, but the clue is in the title. It's a process. It's not an event. It is not an event. And there's many, many opponents to the process, and not all of them are about the There's clearly those who are, who are committed to continuing violence, but there's others who are trying to undermine the peace process as well, because it either doesn't fit their version of history, or they may not like the outworkings of it, or they may not like those who are involved in it because of their history. So I, I accept the right of people to, to criticize, I accept the right of people to be frustrated, but I think we always have to go back to the starting point and say, well, where were we, and where do we want to go? And despite all of it, I think we're heading in the right direction. Um, in conclusion, one of the areas, understandably, of, of, of Nancy, where we, we are commemorating this time of year is the Psalm on the Easter Rising. And today I'm announcing that we are going to invest in, in curricular materials for our teaching work workforce to teach one or the other, to teach both. But as I said earlier, those curricular materials will not say, this is the version of history you must adhere to, this one over here, not so good. It's up to the professionalism of our teaching workforce to go through the curriculum materials and teach them to their classes, which, in a manner which all education is about. It is to open the minds of the students we are working with and allow them to further research, to further investigate all of the issues which are raised, and then, you know what? Let them come to their own conclusion. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, for going uh, into the discussion that we have started and actually building up on that. I think it was a very interesting contribution that we certainly will take with us. Um, I'd like to now um, invite Alan Thurston, who is head of the School of Education, which has been very supportive of us organizing this conference, but <coughs> logistically as in terms of content. So, please make your opening statement. So you're very welcome here at Queen's University Belfast and a particularly warm welcome from the School of Education. We were delighted that you chose to come to Belfast and we were particularly pleased to be able to lend our support uh, to your conference. Uh, conferences such as this are, are really important professionally for teachers, for teacher educators uh, and uh, as you'll have noticed already for, for particularly some of our students, and I know there'll be other students here as well. And uh, I suppose my job is relatively easy, and I'm, I'm just going to encourage you to come to Belfast, uh, enjoy Belfast, uh, enjoy Queen's University Belfast in particular, uh, make good networks. Um, I hope that your sessions uh, go well for you and that your, your networks are further established. And hopefully that during those um, sessions and that, that I've looked at the conference program, which looks fabulous, I have to say, uh, I might wait around for and, and attend a number of the sessions, um, that uh, you, your ideas are challenged and you challenge others' ideas and you come up with new and fresh ideas that you can take away with you. Uh, and more than that, I hope that you leave some of those new fresh ideas here with us uh, to help enhance our education system. Although there's going to be a lot of talk about divided societies in Northern Ireland, uh, there are things that do unite us. And one of the things that does unite us strongly in Northern Ireland, as parents or as teachers or as teacher educators, is wanting the best for young people um, and wanting the best education possible. 
Now, there are a lot of debates over uh, what the best way forward to provide that is, but what is undoubtedly true in Northern Ireland is that a better education leads to better life outcomes. And so I, I, we're delighted that you're here because we know that you'll add to uh, that debate and it, it increase the uh, 